everyone. Welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedarly Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of September 27th to October 3rd. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool, Judy, and Aquarella. We'll also be discussing our waning interest in talented filmmakers. We accidentally discover a brand new, very tiny subgenre of films. And our Cedarly three picks for best comeback films. Well, we always like to start off the show with the last scene first. So, Dave, what is the last film you've seen? The last movie I saw was Flirting with Disaster. David O. Russell's, uh, you know, mid-90s hilarious comedy with Ben Stiller and Patricia Arquette and Lily Tomlin and Mary Tyler Moore. Just an amazing cast. Yeah. I hadn't seen it in probably 10 years. I don't even know the last time I saw Flirting with Disaster. I'd almost kind of forgotten it existed. And then I was like, it popped up like as a streaming option. I'm like, that's what I'm going to watch. I'm totally in the mood for it. It was like exactly what I needed. I wanted something that I had, I was working on something, um, a project at home. So I needed something I had seen before many times right. that I could still appreciate without paying 100% attention to since I pretty much have that movie you know, I know I've seen it at least a dozen times, yeah. so I didn't have to worry about missing plot points or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it still holds up. It's still very funny. And uh, the chemistry between everybody in that movie is really fun. Yeah. So I enjoy it. There's always that worry that like you got a great cast together, but is the chemistry going to work right once you're actually yeah. on set and you're doing something together? Well, I always joke that I have sort of a cinematic rule that if you have more than two, potentially three named stars in your film, yeah. that's usually a bad sign because they've they've tried to compensate for a weak script or something like that by by putting star oh. power in it. <laughs> by loading it up, yeah. But there's certain, uh, you know, kind of auteur directors that that is not true for. Yeah. You know, obviously, like Woody, Al- Woody Allen and Paul Thomas Anderson and David O. Russell, you know, everyone wants to work with them. Right. So they get these amazing casts assembled. And, you know, they're obviously fantastic writers and right. it's a great script. So it's it's just really cool whenever you see a movie that you're not distracted by all, all the name faces. That's true, it, too. That you just get to enjoy them in their zone. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, uh, Altman came right to mind, too, where it's like, yeah, yeah just, exactly. You don't, oh, yeah. It, it is. It's a stacked cast, but I don't right. watch it because, oh, it's the cast there. It's usually the right. story of the director. Yeah. 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 And I had totally forgotten, actually, that Mary Tyler Moore was even in it for some reason. Like in my memory of the movie, I forgot Mary Tyler Moore played Ben Stiller's adopted mother. And she is fantastic in it. She's, it's a very different kind of histrionic kind of role for her. And I enjoy it. Are you still uh, keeping up like I, my fandom? Wait, my my fanaticism for David O. Russell has kind of waned over the years. Like it started off, I think it peaked with I Heart Huckabees and I couldn't wait to see. Uh-huh. You know, it built to that. And I was like, oh, my God, I cannot wait to see what this guy does next. And I've just slowly become less interested, although I keep up with his movies, but I don't have like yeah. that passion I used to have when he started out. Yeah, like uh, his films aren't maybe as edgy as they were they're, they're but they're still I mean, he's a, he's becoming more of a craftsman in a way. You know what That's I mean? That's true. Like, yeah. He's, he's a very talented filmmaker, obviously. And it's, you know, I certainly will always watch his movies and it's funny when you talk about I Heart Huckabees which is such a divisive film I remember whenever Jason Schwartzman was at the Cedar Lee for a Q&A mm-hmm. and I had uh, a DVD of that movie to have him sign yeah. for a friend he, he said something to the effect of finally someone that likes this movie like oh my god <laughs> I was like, I would think people that encountered Jason Schwartzman would probably be more inclined to appreciate I Heart Huckabees. But uh, yeah, apparently he must get a lot of grief over that film. Or that something. is so, so he sad here. Like, that is so, like, one of my, my favorites of his. Like, I've seen that one, like you said, with uh, Through a Disaster. I could put on I Heart yeah. Huckabees and kind of just narrate it as, a, as, a, as it goes and do yep. all the lines. We've seen it so many times. Because mm-hmm. it's also a movie that just probably shouldn't work at all. But no. you know, it really yeah. does. Yeah, but that's a, a legendary, you know, we talk about l- the the internet viral video of Lily Tomlin and and uh, him having their, you know, meltdown on, on set. Oh, r- oh, my God, yeah. I forgot about that, too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the behind-the-scenes antics. Yeah, antics, that's a way to put antics, it. Antics, yeah, being polite, polite and euphemism. What, what was the last film you saw? Um, I went way, way back to 1929. I was doing some... Oh. Uh, research for a musicals uh, project mm-hmm. I'm working on and I watched the Broadway Melody best picture oh, winner okay. way back mm-hmm. when I think it was the first sound best picture winner it's one of those interesting movies it's very much worth watching if you're into film history and uh, right. film history geek but oh it is it is a chore to get through it's one of those like and it had to happen because it's 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 very well when you look at the early sound tests and how horrible right. those went yeah this one actually nails that, but when you think of the world of musicals, 
Mm-hmm. This one's kind of a kind of a, a slog to get through um, because right. you know it doesn't like it's before Busby Berkeley came on the scene or any of the vi- kind of visual mm-hmm. it's, flair opened up in the musical genre. Yeah, it's a it, I I think I've only seen it once in a long time ago, but I remember it being kind of um, static for a musical. You know, it is I mean? yeah. Like yeah. It's, <laughs> So like it did, it won Best Picture and it became this big thing. I mean, like Arthur Freed wrote the lyrics to it. So obviously he went mm-hmm. on to have a pretty substantial musical career at MGM and others. But um, mm-hmm. it's when it was like it had to happen so that we could move on and learn from the mistakes and figure out, right. you know, what to do next. But yeah, no, it's so static because like, you know, the microphones had to be right there for everybody to be <laughs> able to talk around. And there's yeah. a scene at the beginning where they're going through the the studio where they're putting together the Broadway, their review for this theater. And uh, I had I was watching it with headphones on, and it's just all room noise is all audible, and I had subtitles right. put on so I could know who was talking and what the dialogue was. Mm. Uh, but you really, it's not well mic'd because like mics were brand new and right, yeah, really they didn't have the tech yet. yet. Yeah, well, you know, they did they they did their best, right? And you know, they were rewarded for it. It won, uh, mm-hmm. I think it was like what the second Academy Awards, maybe it won Best Picture. So right, um, you know, it was rewarded, and it was one of those like it had to happen so that we could you know move on with the craft and become a lot better at uh, you know. Recording mm-hmm. sound and syncing it up and then adding a visual flair to it in the long run. So, well, there's a couple just booked titles that we wanted to s- put on people's radar because uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some excited folks out there for El Camino, which you had to remind me. Yes. It doesn't say, yeah. you know, Breaking Bad, colon, El Camino. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I think it's like El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. Right. Is I think yeah. how it's like. Being, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So Netflix uh, is allowing us, uh, I think they've kind of handpicked a few theaters to play it and the Cedar Lee is one of them Woo-hoo! and we're going to be playing it it's just a three-day only engagement so if you want to see El Camino on the big screen you'll have to come see it uh, I think it's October 11th 12th and 13th those days and I believe tickets yeah tickets are already on sale at the Cedar Lee uh, at, at the box office or at clevelandcinemas.com or now on Fandango because we are now on Fandango. So you can buy tickets for all of Cleveland Cinema's locations on there as well. So all those questions about, do you take this Fandango gift card? <laughs> well, no one takes a Fandango gift card at the box Well, office. I just meant, yeah, and not to be used <laughs> to purchase tickets in advance uh, right. if you're using I know, the internet. But I just think that's right. funny. Like, no one reads it. Like, yeah, you have to, it's a Fandango is an, only an it's online own platform yeah. for buying tickets. So you have to <laughs> use that gift card online. I would say it's a rare treat to get, like, a beloved TV show on the big screen, but uh, mm-hmm. it's not that rare right now with Downton Abbey on the big screen. and right. Yeah, uh, Downton Abbey, which was which was huge this last weekend. So yeah, number one at the box uh, office overall too. Yeah, and setting a box office record for the distributor for Focus Features. It was their largest opening oh, ever. Oh, excellent. So yeah, and then another film that I want to give a quick shout out that's going to be coming here. We mentioned it last week whenever I was talking to John Foreman. At the time, it wasn't confirmed, and that's Joker. We weren't sure yet if we were going to be able to play it here at the Cedar Lee, but the studio finally agreed. So Joker is going to be opening. So the Venice award-winning uh, Venice Film Festival award-winning uh, movie will be playing here and it is kind of an early Oscar front runner at least for Joaquin Phoenix right. so it's uh it's unusual that the Cedar Lee is playing a studio superhero movie yeah but this one is not your traditional superhero movie and people I think the the artistry that's involved in this film and the kind of social commentary with it uh, is going to get a lot of conversation started so I hope uh, people come out and see it here and in the world of award winners coming fresh off of the Toronto Film Festival, the I, I don't know, I keep reading that it was like a surprise audience award winner. It was, uh, yeah. Jojo was. Rabbit is coming mm-hmm. November 1st. So there actually is a date for that now, so mark your calendars for that. It's sort of becoming mm-hmm. a ritual now that the audience award winner from, from Toronto ends up landing mm-hmm. in November and uh, in the previous years keeps playing all the way through to January because that yep. audience knows how to pick them. And it also usually uh, ends up being one of the Best Picture nominations yeah. for the Oscars. So come out and see Jojo Rabbit. I personally love that movie. It's popping up in really odd places. Um, I'm always on the lookout having an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old for movies that aren't mm-hmm. at the multiplex that I could take them to. And right. I'm not necessarily sure Jojo Rabbit's going to be that movie or not. I'll quiz you a bit more on the plot details off my sure. no spoilers. But um, it popped up on whatever my son, who's 11, was watching some on YouTube, and he was like, "Hey, Dad, have you seen? Because you know, you know, like like comedies." He's like, "Yeah, have you? There's a movie where like Hitler's this boy's like imaginary friend." I was like, <laughs> "How did you just discover Jojo yeah. Rabbit?" He watches like you know Minecraft tutorials, right? And, you know, Terraria yeah. walkthroughs. Is like, but I don't know whoever's doing their marketing. Like they're. They're, they're getting it out there. I think it is rated PG-13. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the, the main character is, like, roughly his age, yeah. a little bit younger. So I was like, yeah, right. I mean, if you, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll go see it. Let's, let's, mm-hmm. let's check it out. 
Uh, and we'll be uh, we'll be right back with the new films that are opening this week here at the theater. <laughs> And the first film that we're opening is another title that was really buzzed about at the Toronto Film Festival, and that's Judy, directed by Rupert Gould, and it is starring Renee Zellweger as Judy Garland as she arrives in London in the winter of 1968 to perform a series of sold-out concerts. I'm sorry it's so late. Miss Carl. Oh, please. I'm Judy. I'm very sorry, but your suite has been released. What do you mean, released? Where exactly has it gone? <laughs> your account was in arrears. Clang, clang, clang. The trolley. Mama, please don't go to sleep now. No, 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 leave the other one. Zing, zing, zing. The kids need a home, Judy. I know what kids need. They need their mother. You can't have the world's greatest entertainer out here without a drink. Frank Sinatra's here? Frank is great, but he is no Judy Garland. Chug, chug, chug. I don't have a home. I can't even get a manager. London would offer you a lot of money. Talk of the town is desperate to do a deal with you. You're saying I have to leave my children if I want to make enough money to be with my children? You mentioned coming out of Toronto, having a lot of buzz. One of the critics I always follow, Ann Thompson, who writes over at IndieWire, she had tweeted out something about how, like, the best actress... Uh, race for this year is on, and it's uh, Renee Zellweger for Judy and Christert's, Kristen Stewart as well uh, for her performance and as uh, Jean Seberg. So it was immediately oh, right away yeah. just like, oh, nope, here, here's the one to beat. And she's right. really like on point with her predictions over the year, over the decades yeah. uh, in her Hollywood yeah. reporting. So she's not joking around with this one. Well, obviously, this movie and that performance has everything that screams Oscar about it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Unless it would have been a complete misfire right. or something, anything else. I mean, you know, people, the Academy loves to award performers who are playing real people. Right. Especially Hollywood icons too, that. Right. You know, so it's, it's kind of playing to the, uh, playing to the, the audience there. And it's, right. but yeah, the, everything I've heard about it, I haven't gotten a chance to see it yet. And I'm, I'm very anxious to see it. It's the top of my list for this weekend. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. And I've always enjoyed Renee Zellweger and certainly she can, we all know she can do a musical based on her fantastic work in Chicago. Oh, so right. I, I'm very excited to see it and I'll be curious just even the, the vocal kind of, style that she's you know trying to not you know i guess mimicking judy garland a little bit in the uh thing she gets like the essence of it of course she's not judy garland so she's not going to be able to sing exactly like judy garland right. but you really get it seems authentic and it seems real and so i'm I'm excited to see it i'm curious as to wonder why do they focus in on this particular limited run of like this british tour that she went on and not like a full full biopic well, it reminds me of like the the Stan and Ollie movie that we just showed too. It's oh, the right, same thing. yeah. It was like you know these two classic Hollywood performers who are doing this, you know, tour in England. You know, at the, at the end twilight of their part and, of their career. Yeah. Of course, Judy Garland. We didn't know that this was going to be well, right, right towards the end of her yeah. life and career at the time. I'm sure she didn't necessarily think so either, since she died so young. She wasn't even fifty when she died. So, um, you know, it's but it's interesting though that there's been two films kind of about this. You know, that there are these you know iconic Hollywood stars uh, performing in England. That's a very specific little uh, niche uh, subgenre. <laughs> um, then uh -huh. is uh, I didn't see it but my week with maryland a couple years ago was that set in england as well it was in england yeah so another uh -huh. okay so that's a, a genre with three titles so far just on the top <laughs> of our heads uh yeah but maryland wasn't like she wasn't on like a performing tour as i as i recall was no i think she? it was just like remember yeah it was just something yeah but, she was there filming a but movie, still it yeah. was like instead of a full right. biography of marilyn Monroe, we got yeah. like you know one week just in her life yeah in england in england yeah, i don't so. know that is an interesting thing to think yeah. about and look into a little more <laughs> that might be the only three movies i don't know but <laughs> Uh, the next film we have opening up, I cannot wait to see. I'm a big Miles Davis fan. So uh, this movie is Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool from director Stanley Nelson. Um, this feature explores archival photos, home movies that were shot by Miles and his colleagues. So it's a real true like behind the scenes look at Miles Davis through the years. Um, it goes into like his manuscripts, some of his original paintings. It explores, you know, as we were saying with Judy, it kind of narrows in on a certain, you know, period of her career. This is, you know, a career uh, defining documentary that takes us through the life of legendary musician Miles Davis. Music has always been like a curse with me. It's the first thing in my life, go to bed thinking about it and wake up thinking about it. That's all I live for. Miles started very early. He looked at things differently. He saw things differently. Without a doubt, the most unique person I've ever known. 
They wanted to be an artist just like Stravinsky. A lot of the old guys thought that if you went to school, it would make you play like you were white. If you learned something from theory, you would lose the feeling in your playing. I wanted to see what was going on in all of music. Juilliard, in the daytime and at night, he'd be on 52nd Street. He put the bell of his horn right into the microphone and changed the whole world of jazz right there. He comes up with a style that is truly reflective of who he is. He was angry, antisocial. But then he starts playing and people are like, oh, he just disarms you. He surrounded himself with young, emerging, unknown voices. We were kids. We were looking at every night going to a laboratory. Miles was a head chemist. He wanted us to live on the stage, creating in front of the people. Don't lean on what you know. What he was looking for is the stuff that you don't know. We didn't just want to play with Miles Davis. We wanted to be Miles Davis. So, yeah, this is another uh, iconic music documentary that we're showing. Yeah. You know, we've had so many performer documentaries lately, uh, but this is the, really the first jazz icon that we've had. We've had a lot of, you know, rock musicians true. and even classical ones. Yeah. But this is our first one that we've had that's a jazz musician that I can think of. This one uh, comes from director Stanley Nelson, who I was looking up because I, I was like, that name sounded vaguely familiar, but I couldn't place like where mm -hmm. I'd heard him from. But uh, he did the Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution documentary a couple years back, which was great. Mm. And if you look at his filmography, it's a lot of PBS American Experience documentaries, which gotcha. I think we can kind of guess the basic format then, which is, you know, the right. deep dive, you know. Uh -huh. I'm really curious because Miles Davis, uh, his autobiography, which I've read, is really fascinating. He kind of did like a warts and all story. And mm -hmm. it, though even from the preview, like it does seem like it's going to tackle like his full life and not just, you know, leave out the inconvenient parts of, you know, right. like drug addiction and, you know, personal demons and things. So I'm really looking forward to this one just to sort of see. Uh, I think a lot of people, even if they aren't aware of it, know a lot of his music and then seeing, you know, like what it was that went into uh, right. producing that and performing that, too, as well. And kind of popularizing in the mainstream a uh, certain section of jazz um I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this one. He's literally clapping his I hands. I am, yeah. With Sorry. It's an audio medium, go. but I was trying to clap away from the <laughs> mic for some reason. <laughs> Well, the next film that we're opening is a very unique documentary called Aquarella, directed by Viktor Kazakovsky, and it is exploring water as the main protagonist. It's seen in all its great and terrible beauty. So it's a very unique look at water around the world so it's kind of and it's divided up in sections so like the whole first section is all just about ice and then the oceans and it's a very interesting kind of perspective perspective on the role that uh, water plays in our interactions with it and the effects that it has on our planet when you say like this is a documentary in which water is the main protagonist mm -hmm. i can yeah picture a bunch of people kind of yawning right now as you pitch that but this is one of those where like no it, this is about the photography but also yeah. like it, it folds in like it is a nature documentary the role that plays mm -hmm. like you said it starts off with ice but there's also like you know hurricanes that's water mm -hmm. you know like it's right it's a lot of different um you know amazingly photographed kind of meditative uh look at you know Right. Water. Well, and, and I think this is in the, I believe it's, it's been so, I've saw, I saw the movie quite a while ago, so I'm trying to remember what's in the film and what was in the trailer, but they, uh, there's a scene, you know, in the ice section specifically, it actually has some real kind of suspense and tension because they're, I think they're in Greenland. I can't even remember where they are when they're filming the segment, but, uh, because it doesn't have like narration or anything like that. It's just like, it's presenting things like right. this is you know, just the shot. So where these people, um, you know, the indigenous people there, they drive their cars across these frozen lakes and frozen, you know, passageways. So they just use land bridges or ice bridges right. that appear seasonally to shortcut across things. But then every year when the ice starts to melt and it gets a little precarious, people stupidly go out there. And so there's these rescue teams that have to like go out and like try to save people's lives and rescue salvage their cars that have sunk into the, into the water. It's very um, compelling, you know, I'll say like I'm getting way. like sweaty wages of fear palms right now, just as you're yeah, describing it's, that. <laughs> it is, it's, 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 you know, it's unsettling. So it's, it's a very unique documentary. It's, it's not like coin a or one of those, so kind just of, thinking, yeah. you know, things, but it's, it's closer to that than 
you know, a talking head documentary. You know what I mean? It right, is right. just footage of uh, of the subject, which is water. Well, so the scope of it too, like it is a big screen. Like it's about the cinematography mm-hmm. and the visuals yeah. uh, in this particular story. So it's definitely a big screen mm-hmm. experience that you want to have. And then we also wanted to give a quick shout out to a film that is going to be opening over at our sister theater, the Capitol Theater this week. And it is a great new dark comedy called Villains by Dan Burke and Robert Olson. It's a dark comedy about two dim-witted criminals who pick the wrong house to hide out in. And I loved this movie. I'm so glad we're showing it. Uh, we were going to try to play it over at the Cedarly, but we just didn't have space for it. So it's going to be playing over at the Capitol, which uh, it kind of more kind of belongs more over at the Capitol, to be honest with you. But it's it's just a really fun movie. It stars Bill Skarsgård, if you've seen It. Of course, he plays Pennywise in It. And uh, Micah Monroe and Jeffrey Donovan and Kira Sedgwick are in it. And it's just a really fun kind of twisty little dark comedy. You know what I mean? So yeah. what we, we think going to be happening, isn't going to happen. You never quite know where it's going to go next. And it is laugh out loud funny in a, a great way. So I would really encourage people to check it out. It probably is only going to be playing for one week over there. So if you're interested and you like a fun, twisted, dark comedy, I'd really recommend it. Bill Sarsgaard is so iconic now with it that like as soon as you said his name, I wasn't picturing him. I'm picturing yeah. Pennywise. Pennywise. Yeah. So <laughs> I need a palate cleanser yeah. to put a different image back in my head. If you want to see him and expand so you're not just seeing him as a creepy yes. clown, uh, you can just see him as, you know, a, a dumb criminal. There you go. All right. We'll, we'll be right back with our Cedar Lee three picks for this week. <laughs> Well, each week we like to take inspiration from one of the new films that we're showing and suggest three films to broaden your cinematic world. This week's topic was inspired by Judy. We were kind of thinking Renee Zellweger hasn't been, you know, Mm -hmm. front and center Hollywood star for a little bit. So we're looking at comeback films. This looks to be, you know, a really solid comeback film for her. And this really opened up a gap in my film knowledge because, like, the idea of a comeback film is more culturally where that actor or actress lies within you know, the zeitgeist. And like, I'm not following Mm -hmm. the ups and downs of careers of like Mads Mikkelsen or Michelle Yao or Juliet Binoche. Like, I don't know when like they have a bomb in their home country because (laughs) I'm not really following it that way. And also other countries don't really look at it the same way we do with like box office bombs because they're not spending $300 million on these giant projects. So I really just had to stick with Americans, uh, actors and actresses, because I am aware of their personal lives here for better or for worse and know when they're on the outs within the industry. So what's the first one on your list? Well, the first one that came to mind I just had to do because I it just came up, um, I want to say a week or so ago, uh, Pam Greer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jackie awesome. Brown in 1997. Mm-hmm. Now, she was, this is one of those weird, like, they're kind of fluid definitions with each of my picks where, like, she was around and active, and right. I'd watch some of her movies, and I was like, oh, yeah, that was a good role or whatever. But, like, that was clearly, like, she's back. Yeah, that was the first time that she was... You know, I mean, in the 70s, she was the lead star above the title of a whole bunch of films. Oh, a bunch and this of was ones, the yeah. first time in decades that she had her name as the star of a film right, again. Right, so right. That's 100% what it, yeah. that's a comeback. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to keep in that same vein and we'll just stick with Tarantino, who okay. seems to be the comeback king. Kind of is. The first one that popped into my head was, of course, John Travolta in Pulp Fiction right. because he was a, a pop culture joke. And then, you know, he was had this movie coming out won the award at the Cannes Film Festival, mm-hmm. and then everyone's like, oh, my. and then John Travolta gets an Oscar nomination again, you know? So he was definitely, like, back. And after that, he was, again, a, a viable, like, star for films. You know, he was became an action star. He was in, like, Face Off and all these other movies. Right. Of course, now he's again... In a, in a major career lull and has become yeah. another little punchline. But who knows? He could be one good, you know, script away. Right. He's certainly a great, you know, star. He's a you know, very talented actor and he can do a lot of different things. He just needs to be in the right project. Right. So, Working with the right people. As as, and, yeah. Yeah. As long as someone gives him a better script than some of the things he's been doing lately, which yeah. he even, what was the movie he shot here in Cleveland? He shot one here in Cleveland that went, or was it Ohio? Maybe it was in Cleveland. I can't even remember. But I know that one didn't really get released other than VOD maybe. Um, right, so right. There's, yeah, a lot of his stuff is right now just going VOD or makes headlines for how little money it makes in the few theaters that it plays. Yeah, or Gotti just is like a punching bag yeah. of like right. you know, one of the oh, worst I didn't, movies of the year. I kind of want to see Gotti yeah. just to see if it's as bad as everyone says. But you have to think about, at least for a while, John Travolta had a huge comeback uh, after Pulp Fiction. Right, yeah, having a comeback doesn't mean that they're still, you know, currently right. in it that comeback. It just it doesn't it mean it necessarily. It, it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean it's stuck. Yeah. 
So the next one I wanted to mention is a different style of comeback, which there's a lot of different examples here. Like my first thought was like Christina Ricci kind of thing, but mm -hmm. I went with Michelle mm. Williams because she was very well known for TV sure. and back in the 90s. Um, well, not late 90s into the early 2000s, the CW was a big force as far as like teen uh, soap operas go. So she was mm -hmm. one of the stars of Dawson's Creek. And so that was such a huge uh, a huge cultural impact. Maybe it was just because I was that age, like that was my finishing high school, starting college right. kind of period. So it was, I was the demographic for that show, although I only watched like three or four episodes of it. But she was really well known for that. And then it was one of those, well, how is she going to transition into film at all? And it took a few years. She did a bunch of different roles that I was looking up. I was like, I don't remember that movie at all. Yeah. But in, um, I think she hit her stride in 2008 with Wendy and Lucy, the Kelly Reichert film, which wasn't a huge success, but performance wise, you know, it, it let people know she's not going like the romantic comedy Hollywood route. She's not just right. going like the uh, the sexy starlet kind of route. She's looking for a specific kind of roles and she wants to sink her teeth into it. And she has the chops to actually do it as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know Brokeback Mountain was like, oh, five, but she's not really. And she has a good, she has a good role there, but it's it's in a good performance. But it's not really like you said, the central, um, you know, I right. think. Uh, Wendy the and Lucy, supporting. like the whole movie is based on her performance and it's yes. so strong on that one. And then you can look at her filmography since 08 and it's just a string of just, oh, well, my week with Marilyn, we just mentioned a little bit yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's very yeah. strong ever since then. So I think she really kind of, she found her footing after Wendy and Lucy in 08. And I thought she was great in After the Wedding that we just had. Oh, right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's still doing very good work. But it also like well, it eclipses the Dawson's Creek kind of oh. um part of her career yes. so like it's like that's not what right. she's known for anymore now it's like these nominated roles that she's had over the years i had totally forgotten she was even on dawson's creek since i never watched it see so that's, how, that's go. how good see? her, her mm -hmm. comeback slash transition was <laughs> there you go well my next comeback was um as a director uh i was thinking about whenever robert altman had been sort of in you know had not done anything of critical importance or certainly financial success for for quite a while and then he did the player in 1992 and it was the movie that brought him totally back and everyone True. was like altman's back and after that he had a whole like a you know third act of his career of really just a lot of great films coming out after the player as well so it was nice to see one of my favorite people back in stride right you know? right even though he had made some interesting films in the 80s um not every one of them was uh i can't defend oc and stigs too much <laughs> i don't know i'm one of a handful of people that have even seen oc and stigs and i've seen it more than once but you know it's very weird whenever you think about like this is the guy that did nashville and right, MASH. right and then when you see the player you're like oh yeah this is the guy that did nashville and mash you know like yeah yeah back. <laughs> so uh, so I just wanted to, of course, anytime I can talk about Robert Altman, I'm always you there do, to do that's it. That's true. Mm -hmm. He's a director too that I, in my head, he's got, I think it's cause he has so many iconic films, like those like six to mm -hmm. eight, like iconic films that you, you know him for. But when you look up his filmography, like he was constantly working. There were times yeah. when he was putting out two movies a year. Um, mm -hmm. so it's one of those, like, he wasn't like kind of Paul Thomas Anderson throughout his career. He was like just constantly making stuff, which I think is mm -hmm. somewhat even more impressive sometimes. Cause it, it, in my head, it, that translates to like, he's just got the talent in him and it's inherent to him. And right. it just, sometimes it matches up with the right project and you get a Nashville or you get a mash mm -hmm. or, you know, you get a, the player out of it. Uh, the last one I would mention actually ties perfectly in with, uh, next week when we'll be discussing the Joker is Joaquin Phoenix. Mm, I forgot, mm -hmm. and some of this I think maybe has to do with our age where we've just been watching and, and paying attention to and reading and studying films for a few decades now, where it was uh, a time when he, after, you know, so he does walk the line, he, you know, he started off his film career with To Die For, like he didn't have a lot of like terrible movies that he had to like come back from, but he mm -hmm. announced that he was retiring from acting and then he disappeared for a few years and then he came back in 2010 with the fake documentary I'm Still Here. Right. He had some appearances on Letterman, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Letterman was still around yeah. then, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, what, what, what is, what what's is going he on here? Doing yeah. here? And also like the rumors and the piece? stunts yeah. that are behind the yeah. scenes while he was shooting. I'm still here with um, Casey Affleck directing him there in 2010, and then that movie came out, and everyone's like, what the, f what? Yeah. <laughs> and then he kind of laid low for a couple of years, and then he came back with the master. So it kind of mm -hmm. like, as good as his performances have been since 2012 and the master, it's kind of rewritten or just completely pushed to the back burner that whole like troubles Weird maybe he was having yes. i don't know what was going on yeah. there for a few years but like retiring then doing that movie and i, I uh -huh. don't know what that was if he had like a, his andy kaufman era of his career is kind of forgotten now mm -hmm. but um that was a strong enough comeback that everybody forgot all that craziness and now he's he's back in the good graces of of uh of yeah. hollywood and he's probably going to be looking at uh would this be if he gets nominated this would be his like fourth i think so yeah it's quite if he gets yeah. nominated for the joker so or for joker it's not right. the joker it's just joker 
Well, the next one I want to talk about is a uh, kind of classic Hollywood. Uh, it's a double comeback. And it was, of course, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane with Betty Davis and Joan Crawford from 1962, where they were, you know, certainly not bankable stars. No one wanted to give this right. movie money. Like, no one thought this would make any money. Of course, it was like the biggest box office hit of the year, I think, that year. And is an iconic film yeah. where... Um, you know, well, Betty Davis is the only one that got nominated. Joan Crawford didn't get nominated, but uh, it's it's just it's still like a timeless classic movie. And when we talk about comebacks not necessarily sticking, that's one of those ones. Like oh, they yeah, were, yeah. you know. <laughs> but it was also they were, you know, fighting. Uh, you know, they had an uphill battle as actresses of a certain age in a certain time of, in the, in America. You know, there just weren't a lot of roles for them that would have probably allowed them to continue that. Uh, right. And then they just ended up having to do more similar sort of things and the whole hag exploitation kind of thing where Betty Davis just basically became, you know, uh, uh, an actress in these kind of B level horror movies or, you know, thrillers, not always horror movies, but. And of course, then poor Joan Crawford ended up having to do Trog, and it just gets sad after that. But does, for a little yeah. while, just like you know, for a little while, they had their huge comeback, and they were you know the glamorous stars of the number one movie in the in the country again. I was kind of looking at some film history too, like uh, that, like that's a really good pick from that. Because, but then I was like, I don't really know what the people's careers were because like i you know mm -hmm. I, most of my picks were from when like i've been paying attention to films so like, right. i know like oh yeah that person was on the outs or like oh they were only known for tv oh you're gonna try film now come on uh -huh. um but yeah knowing a little bit more of like that was not an era when either of those actresses were getting because it was like that hollywood trend was starting to transition right. a little bit and the studio system sort of falling apart you're not a contract player anymore yeah, I mean Betty Davis. They were they Betty Davis was doing a lot of TV work, and you know, just right. uh, you know, had been relegated to that. So she was certainly not a, a you know a studio name actress draw anymore on anyone's list. Right. So it was great to see them back. Well, next week's episode, we will be discussing three new films that are opening. We'll be showing Honeyland, Before You Know It, and Joker. So next week's Cedar Lee three picks are inspired by Joker. We're going to be looking at great anti-heroes in film history. Submit any picks you want to send our way at Cedar Lee Theater using the hashtag Cedar Lee three, the number three. But before we sign off for this week, we do want to let you know about a few special events we have coming up. We First, we have Fathom Events and G Kid Present, The Secret World of Arietti as part of Ghibli Fest 2019. That's going to be playing Sunday, September 29th at 12.55 in the dubbed version. And then the subtitled version is going to be playing Monday, September 30th at 7 p.m. And we're also continuing uh, with the Fathom Event Friends 25th Anniversary Celebration, Saturday, September 28th at 7 p.m. and Wednesday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. as well. And we actually have two National Theater Live productions this coming week. One is an encore presentation of the... Uh, Tony Award winning and I think an Olivier Award winning uh, production of One Man, Two Governors starring James Corden in his Tony Award winning role. And that is going to be playing Tuesday, October 1st at 7 p.m. This is part of the 10th anniversary series where they're kind of showing some classic films for classic films, classic performances, classic uh, productions from the National Theater Live series. And then there's a new production, uh, which is making headlines right now uh, this week. It's the National Theater Live production of Fleabag, featuring the recent Emmy Award winning actress Phoebe Waller-Bridge. This is a one woman show that uh, is, uh, you know, this, you can watch this on Amazon, but this is the one woman show of her doing Fleabag. And that's on Wednesday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. And tickets for that, there's quite a few tickets sold for that. So I think if you're interested, if you've enjoyed the show, this is something you, re you really can't miss. Yes. I had no idea that was based on or the show was based on that. Like I literally wrote my notes when mm -hmm. I printed about. I was like, not the hit show. Then I crossed <laughs> yeah. it out because I was like, oh, I didn't realize like that was the it origin is. of the show. Yeah. So, <laughs> yep, that's it. That's pretty fantastic. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advance tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedar Lee Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.